without admissibility as submitted. The next one, Your Honor, is PT 3615, Hippo Patel. Okay. The objection to this document depends upon which portion of it they intend to display to the jury. The same portions that were shown in opening statement. That we know that cigarette is an, nicotine is an addictive drug. We expect the Surgeon General to say that cigarettes cause lung cancer. So when he does that, we're going to tell the public, here's a new triple, quadruple, quintuple filter. The same portion we all use. Your Honor, based on the representation that this is the only portion they intend to display to the jury, I'm willing to stand on my written objection to this document. All right. The objection is overruled. Next document. The next one is 1933. <clears throat> the January 29th, 1964 memo. This is a, this is a statement by, um, an executive at Philip Morris, a co-conspirator. It's important to note, Your Honor, that the recipient is it from Coleman to it's from Weissman, who is a senior executive at Philip Morris. Philip Morris was monitoring the release of the Surgeon General's report. Immediately after it came out, he reported to the chief executive of, of Philip Morris, who happened to be on the executive committee of the Tobacco Institute at the time, that what we got to do now is give people a psychological crutch for continued smoking. And the story that will be told through the witness tomorrow, in part, and we'll save some time once this is in, if we get it in now, All is right. that that's exactly what they did for the next 30 years. There are portions of this document on other pages which implicate some of the court's pre-trial rules. If they're not going to publish those portions, then when they stand on my written objections to this document, as well. I think for now we're OK. All right, so then just um, this portion, the objections uh, are overruled. And perhaps, Your Honor, when uh, these documents are uh, prepared to go back to the jury, we can raise those portions and have them redacted. If, 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 if the court agrees when we argue those later, because I, I think those may melt away, as you'll see later, Your Honor. But we won't publish those portions now. All right. The next one, Your Honor, is another Tobacco Institute memo. It's May 1, 1972. The Roper proposal shown in opening statement, PT 2050. Our objections to this document, Your Honor, are limited to the last two paragraphs of this page. It has to be redacted from the document. Number one, on the portion of uh, the document which talks about on the litigation front. Uh, we object to that because, for, for one, uh, litigation strategies are not on trial here. We cannot be liable for defending ourselves in court, and that is from the United States Supreme Court Williams case, from a number of third and fourth DCA cases, which all say the defendants have the right to defend themselves in court. Um, so we would object to that paragraph on that grounds. The next paragraph discusses on the political front, which what with what uh, the industry is doing with respect to advocacy, lobbying, petitioning activities, if Your Honor calls in order to put that type of evidence in front of the jury, plaintiff has to make a showing that whatever was said to Congress or a government agency or government official was a false statement. That was the ruling we had last week during the first election. All right, Mr. Sales. I made three notes, very few others, in Ms. Henniger's opening. One of them was to point out to the jury uh, the date of the first, implying there were others, lawsuits filed against the industry. I think the important thing, so I think that that should go by the wayside. But more importantly, Your Honor, as we explained in the pretrial hearings, this document 42 years ago doesn't put these lawyers in the defense of this case on trial. What it does is educate the jury that one of the reasons that the companies conspired to lie to the public was to win lawsuits, just like the one that Mrs. Henninger, Ms. Henninger was talking about in opening statement. I don't know why, if they're raising the objection, that lawsuits outside this courtroom 
are out of bounds, that they mention those in opening statements. I don't agree. I agree that it's relevant. I agree that it's part of the public information, that there were lawsuits. But most importantly, the head of the Tobacco Institute, which is a named co-conspirator and a defendant in the Engel case, senior executives, the two most at the time, explain why it was that they did the thing that puts us here in court. And that cannot most respectfully be excluded from the discussion of why it is that they were doing what they were doing. On the issue, sorry. You're going to lay a foundation as to this when you get to that portion of the case, or is it just through this ab document? Ab absolutely. Our witness will talk about that. And if Your Honor would prefer that we table this one until Dr. Proctor explains Let's defer the on this. No problem. And respectfully, Your Honor, if when we're doing this and reading them, if I come to one and I'm not doing what we're I'm not making notes right now, can somebody just please help me, you know, not make a mistake? Okay. Now, one thing I'd like to just carry on, uh, I understand that the documents we're going through the public and the uh, you know, we would object to having them again public and Dr. Parker's understand as you put them in. That's not necessary. Obviously, we're not going to waste the jury's time like that. Okay. Any others? The next one is 2268. Uh, regarding the November 17, 1978 meeting in New York. Yes, Your Honor. This is a document. The Council of CTR, which is at the top. Mark Barron, can you show at the very top? CTR is uh, an Engle defendant and one of the co-conspirators. This is an explanation of what it is, and it describes the parties who participated. One of the things that Your Honor is going to learn is that the lawyers for some of these companies, their in-house lawyers and outside lawyers, ran all of this. And so they're identified there. But the purpose of this is to show what it was. There was a suggestion in opening, sort of dueling suggestions about the validity of the science. What this document helps lay a predicate for is the industry's actual support, Mr. Gustafson uh, called it, and I think we're going to see it supported by the evidence, fake science. And this document speaks to that. You know, this is a document that reflects a meeting between lawyers and their clients. On the second page, the, the document, throughout the document, talks about lawsuit and litigation. On the second page, it says CTR has helped, the second highlight, CTR has helped our legal counsel by giving advice and technical information which was needed at court trials. CTR has supplied spokesmen for the industry at congressional hearings. The money spent at CTR provides a base for introduction of witnesses. There's a lot in that paragraph and another to unpack. Point being number one, that CTR is assisting uh, the industry at congressional hearings that is privileged, cannot be liable for that. There's been no allegation that whatever this document is referencing uh, was false or misleading and fraudulent. That's point number one. Point number two, whether CTR helped legal counsel give advice and technical information in court proceedings is irrelevant. They cannot support liability. There's case after case after case after case in Florida and by the United States Supreme Court that says you have a privilege to defend yourself in court and you cannot be liable. Uh, this document is all about the, the, uh, the defendant's litigation of court proceedings in addition it has uh, some of the petitioning efforts from Congress as well. They privileged information. There's nothing wrong with it. It can't be liable for it. It should be an uh, Just How is it not privileged? I, I guess we're not looking at the same document, counsel and I, because it's a document for C, about CTR, an Engel co-conspirator, where which is a defendant in the case for whom this defendant is liable if the jury believes that that had an influence on the smoker's smoking behavior that hurt him. And it talks, and it's underlined there. So this goes to your conspiracy theory? Yes, it says that okay. it was set this up. This document is admitted. Thank you, sir. I have a few more that there are objections to. May I speak to counsel for a minute? That's one of the ones you're doing. Thank you. 
just one page? Oh, it's two pages. Uh, three, four, five. You're the one that was going to do it. Did you tell me what the objection is? Yeah. All right, the next one is PT03777. This is a document from the Tobacco Institute annual meeting in 1980. And okay. Throughout the document, there are references to the TIRC's efforts in opening discussions with governmental agencies, such as the uh, HEW, uh, contact with President Carter, uh, contact with certain members of Congress. Uh, it discusses efforts in lobbying and petitioning on page three uh, with respect to uh, a Dade County ordinance on an anti-smoking referendum. Well, all we want is on page two. It says that they. Which portion do you want to? The admit? Surgeon General's media event was preempted by an institute's first strike news conference. For the first time in the history of the cigarette controversy, the secretary of HEW had to share the spotlight. In fact, we won top billing that night on all networks. Your Honor, we'd be willing if they would simply redact the rest of the document. This and is the be... only thing, correct, counsel? No, there's more. Talks about the power. You heard Ms. Hennigan, Henniger say that nobody was listening to the tobacco industry. They were only listening to public health officials. This says the opposite, an admission by a party opponent. Talks about how many people that they reach with their newsletter that says bald men get cancer more than people with hair, that kind of thing. Again, Your Honor, if we redact the portions of the document. That's not the last one. Privileged okay. information. Before I, I hear from defense, can you show all the portions you'd yeah. like to admit? This is a portion of privilege. How is that privilege? It's privilege because the, the defendants are entitled, it's privileged to have contacts and communications and influence with government officials, including and particularly members of the United States Congress. There is nothing wrong with this. You cannot be held liable for having grade A contacts with Congress. That is not an actionable. Uh, that is not an actionable piece of conduct. Okay. Everything up until this point comes in. As to this issue with uh, having contacts, what does that go to prove? Plans? It goes to prove the same thing that Ms. Henniger was talking about in opening statements, about what was happening in the public domain. This is, this is a suggestion. This case is being tried as in every other case about what was out there. What did people hear? What did they know? And what people were doing or saying everywhere. Ms. Henniger talked in opening statements about people who appeared before Congress to express their view, as she explained it, that the defendants were all wrong, that cigarettes caused cancer, implying that everybody should have known better. And we're not seeking to impose liability for the contact with Congress. What we're seeking to show is that there were two sides to this story. And this is a fair explanation of how it is that that happened. Nobody will ask the jury to impose liability. But how can the defense get to tell the jury what they were doing, the favorable parts of what comes out of Congress when they want to show it to the jury, but we can't show what the other side is. I would submit to your honor that no lawyer for the plaintiff will say, suggest ever, that the defendant should be held liable for, for, for fairly and honestly dealing with Congress. And this doesn't speak to that one way or the other. It just says we're there, giving our point of view. Mm -hmm. just, as, just as when the guy ran down the steps in the video sh that was shown by the plaintiff, as Your Honor will hear from the evidence, actually, what you'll hear from Dr. Proctor is they were paying people. CTR was paying people to go over there and try and tell congressmen and other people things that are lies. That's not protected by any federal doctrine. Okay. Anything else? There's no allegation that this paragraph and anything covered here is fraudulent or false. This is simply trying to impose liability for having contacts with Congress. That, that is what's pretty and it violates your own pretrial ruling on precisely this topic. No. Okay. I don't think this last paragraph is relevant, subject to whatever foundation you might lay out. All right, Your Honor. Any other documents? There are two others about which, over which there are objections. Okay. One is 2184. Oh, there was one more on that one. I'm sorry.
That doesn't seem harmful. We're willing to stand on our objections with respect to that. Thank you. All right, so we got the, the second to last one back. Okay, for now. Got it. All right, thank you. 2184, Your Honor, has heard about this. It was shown also in opening statement. This is the, we call it the Nopic de Clofer, K-N-O-P-I-C-K-K-L-O-E-P-F-E-R, both executives at the Tobacco Institute. It's 2184? Yes, Your Honor. And, and the portion of this document we object to is the very last sentence in the document. All right. Which says that. Mr. Sales, what, what issue is that relevant to? It's an admission of a party opponent, co-conspirator of the Tobacco Institute, that says it is incompatible to um, contrast choice with addiction. And the backstory of this is very important, Your Honor. It's cited in the first part that we haven't looked at. It says that there's a developing idea that nicotine is addictive. As late as 1980, despite what we've just heard in opening statements from the defense, that nicotine is addictive and that the National Institute of Drug Abuse was thinking of saying so. And the tobacco officials are talking, institute officials are talking about how they were asleep at the switch about that. And what are they going to do? And woe is me, what they say is, if that gets out, we have a major problem because we can't call it choice if there is addiction. And that's the plaintiff's case versus the defendant's case. The fact that they're relating it to lawsuits is relevant, as I would submit, Your Honor, was argued previously, because one of the legs of the stool of the conspiracy, as is revealed in the 1972 Roper proposal, is to uh, win lawsuits. And uh, apparently, Your Honor, on our schedule, that was not omitted. But I would like. Uh, I do not see it. Please yeah, but I mean, just if you would, Your Honor, take a look. I know we're not supposed to use the word weight of authority literally in these proceedings, but that is a cornerstone document in these cases. The reason it was offered for its admission is precisely why it should not be admitted. It was suggested that the fact that this, this is relevant to establish that Reynolds could not uh, assert a defense in a lawsuit is the reason why it should be admitted is facetious. It, it's incredible because Reynolds has the right to defend itself in litigation, and this document simply says that the matter of addiction might undermine one of our legal defenses. Mr. Shale said that the litigation front is one of the cornerstones, the pillars of the conspiracy. There's no there's no angle fighting on that. There's no established, and Mr. Shales is laughing, unfortunately, but there's no established uh, element that, that the defendants, the tobacco defendants, engage in a conspiracy to conceal information to further themselves in litigation. That's their allegation, but that's not something that's established in legal cases. This document only goes to Reynolds' defense of itself in litigation, which it is entitled to do, this portion of the document does. And since it's entitled to defend itself in litigation, this is privileged. Uh, Reynolds cannot be liable for that. We would ask that this portion of the document be redacted. Okay. May I be heard briefly, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. Shokardi is their outside counsel, correct? Not them. We have another version of this where we substitute the lawyers, which they said they don't care about that because they're not sure Cardi's not here. But but just the, the sure Cardi, I don't think is a hang up, right? It should say sure Cardi. Okay. Because <laughs> they're not here. <laughs> if they were here, they'd say take it up. But the, the, what I was going to say, Your Honor, is it is lawsuit 101 to contrast what people say when meeting privately and what they say publicly. Not these lawyers, but publicly. The Tobacco Institute, and, and as Your Honor knows, until 1994, the chief executive officer of this defendant said the opposite of that. He said it's not true. He said it under oath. And here you have an emerging consensus in 1980, which we, Your Honor will learn, would have saved millions of lives if there had been a consensus about the addictiveness of nicotine, because that's when a nicotine therapy started to be developed. And here it is that they're saying, we can't let people say it. We can't, we, can't even, we can't even breathe the word addiction, because if we do, we are thereby acknowledging that people do not simply choose to smoke, that it is, in fact, an addictive drug. That is the point of this. It's not an attack on counsel or the defense in this case, but it is certainly fair game to contrast the position that a lawyer takes that nicotine is purely a matter of choice when their co-conspirator says, no, it's not. 
And that's what this reveals. And who's saying this? Two executives, one to the other, of the Tobacco Institute and Engel, defendant. Okay, I think this comes in. So leave it to the party. Any others? Um, we're not going to get past that. Topic. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and, and do these documents, and then after um, the jury leaves, we'll talk about scheduling. Um, can everybody start at 8 tomorrow? Does anyone? I, I don't know how far you all are, are driving in terms of getting here in the mornings. We're all here. We're, we're living here, so we're living around the corner. Okay. Just for the record, two documents that we did the plaintiff defense to show apparently uh, that we are going to stand on our objections. I just wanted to list what those were. Go ahead. They have a record for that. Yes. Those are uh, PT, they're all PT0 numbers. So PT01044, PT01553, PT01608, PT02061, PT03695. 3692 PT 0260-2, 2044-4791-1809-3709-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3689-3
and ready to start? Yes, sir. Okay, Victor, please uh, bring our jury back in. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone take a seat. Thank you uh, for your attendance and cooperation and patience. We'll now turn this over to Mr. Sales for the plaintiff to begin their case. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Your Honor, at this time, uh, consistent with the court's rulings, the plaintiff would move into evidence and seek to publish portions of the select documents offered in the plaintiff's case in chief, beginning with PT 4013. A letter from R.J. Reynolds to Tobacco Company dated June 13, 1928. All right. All of the documents that we've gone over uh, are admitted. And, Your Honor, I won't ask every time, but once Your Honor rules, may I publish portions of the documents? Yes. Would Thank you like the instruction on Yes, <laughs> Page 8. The document you're about to see has now been received in evidence. Witness, witnesses may testify about or refer to this or any other item of evidence during the remainder of the trial. This and all other items received in evidence will be available to you for examination during your deliberations at the end of the trial. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Baron, if you put up uh, PT 4013. And again, members of the jury, Your Honor, this is a letter dated uh, June 13, 1928. Regular school is over. Summer school is starting. Most all high schools, prep schools, colleges, and universities have finished the spring term. And summer schools are now getting underway. This means that thousands of special students and teachers, both men and women, will be assembled at various places during the summer months. Go ahead, if you would, Baron. At any rate, we want you and your men to give these schools immediate attention and then follow up from time to time as often as possible. Moving down, please get started in this work at once. Get your men intensely interested in lining up these students for our brands, both as consumers and boosters. And see to it that the stores and stands near the schools have a good supply of our products. Concludes the reading of that one, Your Honor, and the plaintiff moves in at this time, PT 4014, another letter from the defendant dated September 9, 1927. Okay. Go ahead, Barry. School days are here, and that means big tobacco business for somebody. Let's get it and start after it right now. Give every school a good working just as quick as possible after it opens. Doing trade building work in accordance with present plans and policies. Line up the leaders and the most popular students. In other words, get off to a good start just as quick as you can and then keep up this work at regular intervals. I believe that concludes that document. Your Honor, the plaintiff would move at this time into evidence PT 3400, a strategic research report of Diane Burroughs from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, dated February 29, 
the members of the jury, Your Honor, this is a strategic research report previously labeled secret from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company addressed to Mr. Long, Mr. Orlowski, and Mr. Lees from Diane Burroughs and captioned, Younger Adult Smokers, Strategies and Opportunities. And, Your Honor, members of the jury, we have a few uh, sections of that document to read. So if you would, please, to the first one. It's management summary. The importance of younger adult smokers. Younger adult smokers have been the critical factor in the growth and decline of every major brand and company over the last 50 years. They will continue to be just as important to brands slash companies in the future for two simple reasons. The renewal of the market stems almost entirely from 18-year-old smokers. No more than 5% of smokers start after age 24. The brand loyalty of 18-year-old smokers far outweighs any tendency to switch with age. I'd like you to go to Appendix B now before we go to the rest of it, which is at the end, members of the jury, Your Honor. There's a page of the document, if you can catch the upper right-hand corner there, Baron. It's titled Appendix B. Younger adult smokers' importance as replacement smokers. And then there's a graph and a table below. Let's show the graph first with the label. Can you catch the headline above that? So there's an age axis on the bottom, and it runs from 13, age 13, all the way to age 24. And there's a percentage, and that's explained at the top. Um, it's referring to the percentage of starting age. In other words, the number of people by that age who had started. Go, if you would, please, to the bottom. There's a table. Current male smokers by starting age gives the started ages ranging, ranging from 12 to 25 plus and a median age for the start age of male smokers, which is listed as 16.7 years. All right. If you would go back to the beginning of the document then, Baron. talks about younger adult smokers. Why then are younger adult smokers important to RJR? Younger adult smokers are the only source of replacement smokers. Less than one-third, 31% of smokers, excuse me, start after age 18. Only 5% of smokers start after age 24. If younger adults turn away from smoking, the industry must decline just as a population which does not give birth will eventually dwindle. A few more excerpts from that, Your Honor, members of the jury. In section two, there's a discussion of successful first brand strategies of the past. This section traces every brand which has risen to a 10% or higher share among 18-year-old smokers since the 1930s. There have only been six, but they include the major brands of the last half century. Paul Mall, Winston, Marlboro, Cool, Salem, and Newport. Go ahead. And then there is a discussion of Salem. Just showing this portion for now. Salem, Cool, and Newport. Salem's product breakthrough was light menthol. When Salem lowered the menthol and added a filter, it cut an 8% niche in the market. I think there's a couple more on that. That was the last one. Thank you, Ronald. That concludes 3400. The next document that we have is Claude E. T. Jr.'s Survey of Cancer Research.
dated February 2, 1953. It's PT 3608. Your Honor, we did not discuss this one, but I think counsel is uh, resting on the papers previously supplied and has no further objections. Correct. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we're moving this in then at this time. Okay. This is survey of cancer research with an emphasis on possible carcinogens from tobacco from Claude E.T., 1953, February 1953. Karen, if you would please go to page five, the last full paragraph. Several statistical studies based on clinical data on cancer of the respiratory system have been made, and these studies indicate an abnormal increase in the incidence of such cancers, particularly among men, during the last several decades. These studies indicate that some carcinogen, either airborne or artificially introduced into the respiratory system, is responsible for cancer of the respiratory system, and that widespread exposure to the carcinogen, particularly among men, has been fairly recent and is increasing. The recent rate of increase of cancer of the respiratory system rather closely parallels the recent introduction and rate of increase of cigarette consumption, and this, together with the fact that until very recently the vast majority of cigarette smokers have been men, has raised a very cons considerable question. There appears to be a growing suspicion or even acceptance among medical men and cancer researchers that the parallel increase in cigarette consumption and incidence of cancer of the respiratory system is more than coincidence. So if you would please, to page number. Okay. There is rather general agreement that the incidence of cancer of the respiratory system has increased greatly in the last half century, moving down to where the 26 is, a few lines down. Whereas cancer of the lung was a rare disease 25 years ago, it now occurs nearly as often as cancer of the stomach and more often than cancer of the colon. Moving down to the next paragraph. The increase in the incidence of cancer of the lung, which has occurred in the present century, suggests new or increased contact with carcinogenic stimuli, such stimuli being either airborne or artificially introduced into the lungs. The suggestion that smoking, in particular cigarette smoking, may be a causative factor in the induction of cancer of the respiratory system, including the oral cavity, has been made by many writers on the subject. In 1941, Oshner and DeBakey called attention to the similarity of the curve of increased sales of cigarettes in this country and the greater prevalence of primary cancer of the lung. Go, if you would, please, to the next page. To the numbered points one through eight. Excessive and prolonged use of tobacco, especially cigarettes, seems to be an important factor in the induction of lung cancer. That's one. Two, the incidence of lung cancer is considerably higher among moderately heavy to chain smokers compared to the general hospital population without cancer. Three, the occurrence of lung male, excuse me, lung cancer in a male, male non-smoker is a rare phenomenon. Number five. 96.1% of patients with cancer of the lungs who had a history of smoking had smoked for over 20 years. Few women have smoked that long, 
and this is probably the reason for the greater present incidence among men. Six, 94.1% of the male patients with cancer of the lungs were found to be cigarette smokers, 4% pipe smokers, and 3.5% cigar smokers. Eight, three independent studies have resulted in data so uniform that one may deduce the same conclusions from them. Go to the conclusions at page 14. Conclusions. The increased incidence of cancer of the lung in man, which has occurred during the last half century, is probably due to new or increased contact with carcinogenic stimuli. The closely parallel increase in cigarette smoking has led to the suspicion that tobacco smoking is an important etiologic factor in the induction of primary cancer of the lung. Studies of clinical data tend to confirm the relationship between heavy and prolonged tobacco smoking and incidence of cancer of the lung. Your Honor, that concludes the reading of PT 3608. The next document we have, Your Honor, is PT 1044. Okay. Which is a telegram from Paul Hahn, President of the American Tobacco Company, 111 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, to E.A. Dar, president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company in Winston-Salem. Would you go a little bit higher than you have first line there in view of? In view of the highly publicized, claim, publicized claims of certain medical men not sponsored by any duly accredited scientific medical organization charging serious danger to health from smoking, I suggest for your consideration a meeting of the heads of all of those cigarette companies that have manifested active interest in scientific research and are therefore informed as to the true facts. So if you would please down. Where you have highlighted. Where you have highlighted. And it indicates that the telegram was addressed to the presidents of R.J. Reynolds, Liggett, and Myers, Lorillard, Philip Morris, Brown and Williamson, Benson and Hedges, and, and Mr. Hudson as representative of Tobacco Grows. That concludes the reading of that document, Your Honor. The next one is PT. 2016, the forwarding memorandum from Ed. I would say his name wrong. Deacons? Deacons. Forwarding memorandum from Hill and Knowlton. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. files of Helen Knowlton, and it says that this is the members of the planning committee. So if you would please to the first highlighted section. The attitude of the men we must directly deal with in the industry is at once interesting and important for us to understand. That is why notes on the four interviews with research directors are given at some length. You'll get little from them, excuse me, you'll get from them little real information about lung cancer, pro or con, but you'll find some mighty interesting opinions. One of the men said, it's fortunate for us that cigarettes are a habit they can't break. Said another, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if our company was the first to produce a cancer-free cigarette, what we could do to competition. Said another, suppose everybody smoked just one cigarette a day that would be maybe 40 billion a year. And again, the stock market fall is terrible when you remember dividends are going to be much larger, 
next year without the EPT. So if you would please the next highlighted section. There is only one problem, confidence and how to establish it, public assurance and how to create it, in a perhaps long interim when scientific doubts must remain, and most important, how to free millions of Americans from the guilty fear that is going to arise deep in their biological depths, regardless of any poo-pooing logic, every time they light a cigarette. Sorry. Next paragraph. Problem number two. To reassure the public and still instinctive fears in this interim when definitive facts for giving complete assurance are still lacking, when scientific doubts must remain, and when new unfavorable information can emerge from some laboratory at any time. To act as a bombshell on the whole, whoops, sorry. I was going to finish that sentence. Can you go back? To act as a bombshell on the whole interest, I industry, tobacco industry, if it has meanwhile tried to poo-poo the unfavorable finding to date. Next portion. The fact, of course, the fact is, of course, that no one who has been a heavy smoker is going to benefit himself now by falling into a panic and eliminating the pleasure and comfort of cigarettes. He might just as well go on enjoying his smoke in this interim while research pursues the facts with full assurance that if any cancer-causing agent is ever really found in tobacco, the manufacturers will quickly find a way to eliminate it. You know, I had the Frank statement as exhibit number 307. Sorry. Oh, All right. So let the scientists do the worrying for us. That's their business. And meanwhile, let us go on eating and working and playing and smoking and relaxing and riding in automobiles and living a good life every day. You can count on the cigarette companies who have obligated themselves to pour millions of dollars into cancer research to take anything out of your cigarette that is a health hazard if our science ever really finds such a ha such hazard in the wonderful tobacco leaf. That's the last one. Go ahead and do the Frank statement, TT307. Now, I don't know if I moved in the last two, but that was uh, 2061 and 1044. Okay. And we move in PT307 as well. Frank statement from the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. If you would, please just go straight to the highlighted portions. Yeah, from there down to the end of that column. Distinguished authorities point out that medical research of recent years indicates many possible causes of lung cancer. There is no agreement among the authorities regarding what the cause is. There is no proof that cigarette smoking is one of those causes. Go, if you would, please, to the bottom and, and show who's signing off on that. The Tobacco Industry Research Committee, and it identifies its sponsors, American Tobacco Company, Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, among others. Go ahead to the other column, or below that. We accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility paramount to every other consideration in our business. We believe the products we make are not injurious to health. We have always, excuse me, we always have and always will cooperate closely with those whose, whose task it is to safeguard the public health. That's the right. For more than 300 years, tobacco has given solace 
relaxation, and enjoyment to mankind. At one time or another during those years, critics have held it responsible for practically every disease of the human body. One by one, these charges have been abandoned for lack of evidence. We have next, Your Honor, PT 3695. Okay. Which is a progress report from the Tobacco Industry Research Committee meeting in 1954. You're right, 3694, I'm sorry. And, Your Honor, that is a public relations report from 1955. The previous one was 1954. And we move that in at this time. Okay. And the portion that we'd like to publish of the report starts with the heading, Factors Show Improved Position. Number one. The first big scare continues on the wane. Number two, the research program of the excuse me, the research program of the Tobacco Industry Research Committee has won wide acceptance in the scientific world as a sincere, valuable, and scientific effort. Do you have any more for that? No, that's okay. Well, let's skip that. The next one we have, Your Honor, is 3289. That is the report on visit to USA and Canada dated April 17 to May 12 of 1958. That was the document we had some discussions about, Your Honor. Okay. we we'll move that in at this time. Go, if you would, please, to the itinerary. Members of the jury, the page of the document we're going to show you is a calendar with a list of people these folks, Bentley, Felton, and Reed, spoke to. And where they're from. So on April 17th, they spoke to folks at the American Tobacco Company. And the folks they spoke to are identified in the right-hand column. On April 28th, they spoke to people, among other places, at the TIRC, that's the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. Go ahead. On May 5th, they spoke to additional people at the Industry Technical Committee of the TIRC, and then later spoke to doctors Little, Hookett, uh, Hockett, rather, on May 8th at the TIRC in New York, and then after that spoke to the Scientific Advisory Board on May 10th of the, that year, 1958. Later in the document, members of the jury, there was a discussion of, the, of what they found when they spoke to those people. With one exception, H.S. Green, the individuals whom we met believe that smoking causes lung cancer. If by causation we mean any chain of events which leads finally to lung cancer and which involves smoking as an indispensable link. So if you went to the next section. Carcinogenicity of smoke to animals. No possible doubt now remains that Winder's results using mass, excuse me, mouse skin painting are entirely genuine. The conclusion. All 
although there remains some doubt as to the proportion of the total lung cancer mortality which can be fairly attributed to smoking, scientific opinion in USA does not now seriously doubt that the statistical correlation is real and reflects a cause and effect relationship. And that's the report from British American Tobacco, which was PT 3289. The next document we have, Your Honor, is from the files of R.J. Reynolds from Alan Rodgman. It's PT 3709. It is the smoking and health problem, a critical and objective appraisal. Did I say it was 1962? That's the date of the document. We move that in as well, Your Honor. Okay. This is the document that's been admitted, Your Honor. It's PT 3709 from Dr. Rodman, R.J. Reynolds, 1962. And can you show the first paragraph, please? Cigarette smoke contains 14 polycyclic hydrocarbons and three heterocyclic nitrogen compounds known to be carcinogenic to mouse skin. The hydrocarbons include benzoanthracene, benzo, benzoperylene, benzopyrene, benzoepyrene, chrysine, debenza, debenzanthracene, 1-methylpyrene, Cholinthrene, dibenzopyrene, dibenzoAI pyrene, that was dibenzoAH pyrene, dibenzoAL pyrene, 2 3 dihydro 1H benzocyclopentathracene, and another one. Is that it? Are you doing that to me? Right. Can you show the part that I wanted to show? Thank you. <clears throat> Obviously, the amount of evidence accumulated to indict cigarette smoke as a health hazard is overwhelming. The evidence challenging such an indictment is scant. Yeah, go ahead. Members of this research department have studied in detail cigarette smoke composition. Some of the findings have been published. However, much data remain unpublished because they are concerned with carcinogenic or co-carcinogenic compounds, or patentable material. This raising <coughs> raises an interesting question about the former compounds. If a tobacco company pled not guilty or not proven to the charge that cigarette smoke or one of its constituents is an etiological factor in the causation of lung cancer or some other disease, can the company justifiably assume the position that publication of data pertaining to cigarette smoke composition or physiological properties should be withheld because such data might affect adversely the company's economic status when the company has already implied in its plea that no such etiologic effect exists. That concludes the reading of PT 
3709. And the next one, Your Honor, is PT. Three six one five. It's a strictly and pri strictly private confidential memorandum dated July seventeenth, nineteen sixty three, from Addison Yaman, labeled "Implications of Battelle Hippo, H I P P O, Roman One and Two, and the Griffith Filter." And the first portion we'd like to read, read Your Honor, is uh, oh, we moved that into evidence, Judge. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. The TIRC, in my opinion, excuse me, the TIRC cannot, in my opinion, provide the vehicle for such research. It was conceived as a public relations gesture, however undefiled the scientific advisory board and its grants may be. It has functioned as a public relations operation. There's some more excerpts. Nicotine, excuse me. Moreover, nicotine is addictive. We are then in the business of selling nicotine, an addictive drug effective in the release of stress mechanisms. But cigarettes, we will assume the Surgeon General's Committee to say, despite the beneficent effects of nicotine, may have certain unattractive side effects. One, they cause or predispose to lung cancer. Two, they contribute to certain cardiovascular disorders. Three, they may well be truly causative in emphysema, etc., etc. We challenge these charges, and we have assumed our obligation to determine their truth or falsity by creating the new Tobacco Research Foundation. In the meantime, we say, here is our triple quad or quadruple or quintuple filter capable of removing whatever constituent of smoke is currently suspect, suspect while delivering a full flavor and, incidentally, a nice jolt of nicotine. And if we are the first to be able to make and sustain that claim, what price hint? We have also, Your Honor, um, PT 3681, which is a document from the files of Philip Morris, Tobacco and Health R&D Approach, presentation by Dr. Wakeham uh, at a meeting held in New York on November 15, 1961, and we move that into evidence. Definitions for the cancer, cancer controversy. Carcinogen is defined as a substance which applied to the tissue, excuse me, a substance which applied to the tissue of a test animal gives rise to tumor formation. In tests for carcinogens, it is assumed that tumors ultimately lead to cancerous growths and that a carcinogen so demonstrated in test animals is dangerous to man. contains a list of a partial list of compounds in cigarette smoke also identified as carcinogens. I'm not going to try and read them, but there are a few others that we did not see previously. And then the last section we have for reading, Your Honor, of this document, it says reduction of carcinogens in smoke. To achieve this objective will require a major research effort because carcinogens are found in practically every class of compounds in smoke. This fact prohibits complete solution of the problem by eliminating one or two classes of compounds. The best we can hope for is to reduce a particularly bad class, in other words, 
the polynuclear hydrocarbons or phenols. Two, present technology does not permit selective filtration of particulate smoke. May I ask counsel one more? Go ahead. Subject matter shifts slightly. Um, we do, as Your Honor knows, we wanted to do some of these with the live witness. We do believe he'll be here in the morning so we can complete the rest of the live. Okay. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Thank you for your patience and attention today. We're going to adjourn with you all for today. I'll ask you to be back at 8 o'clock tomorrow so that we can uh, get started in the morning. I will again. I advise you not to discuss this with anyone or amongst yourselves. You may not discuss anything that happened in court today or anything about the case with any family members or friends. You may not do any independent research. Uh, keep in mind that you all will be deciding the case based on what is presented here in the court. All right. Thank you. Please walk out with Victor. Have a great night. I'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Please take a seat. <clears throat> Anything else we can uh, take up now that they've all exited? Well, maybe one thing, at least to start here, Your Honor, we can discuss some scheduling issues, and I'll reference those uh, before Ms. Penny was opening. Um, I recall we had a hearing, uh, maybe a kind of a status conference back in June of this year where we discussed the trial study. That's what we had three weeks. Um, I believe the prediction was made at that point that the trial would take uh, two weeks, perhaps a day or two into the third week. Obviously, if we find ourselves now, we're sort of in the middle of the second week, uh, you know, just the openings and I've had no witness. What are you requesting of the court? Well, uh, one thing I wanted to make the court aware of and as plaintiff's counsel aware of, I've discussed with them yet we have a witness who uh, frankly, before trial started, we anticipated it would be called this week because we thought we would, we would have a case as a defense at the end of the day. Uh, the last day that they can testify before having an unavoidable conflict is next Monday, which is August 18th, I believe. So, uh, depending on where we are, I'm not sure if the plaintiff will be done with their case at that time. Uh, but if not, uh, we would request to be able to call that witness out of order so we could get him on the uh, Okay. Plaintiff? Who is it? Is it an expert or somebody else? It's an expert. It's a man named Dr. Uh, Lawrence Brooks. Well, I mean, we need to object to that. Yeah. Um, they've known about this conflict and they've kept it to themselves. They could have taken this witness's uh, uh, deposition by videotape and played it here in court. But they chose to say nothing. And they chose to say nothing when the court told us last week we're not going to have court on Friday or Monday. And so that made things difficult for us and seeing how you know we're having witness issues and we live with that. And so if they don't have a witness, they've got another witness, another medical witness who can testify to the same things as Dr. Brooks. It wasn't lung cancer, it wasn't caused by smoking. So they, they made a decision to say nothing and not take a video of depot, and now they want to call an expert witness in the middle of our case, and we object to that. Any uh, response to that? Yeah, uh, contrary to where that was, Mr. Jefferson said, we did know about this uh, until very recently. Uh, we also didn't know about the fact that we were going to have it for you. Uh, all along, but we came in last Monday and learned about that. We were operating under the presumption. Uh, that when did you learn about the issue with this witness? Uh, I believe we learned, Your Honor, towards the end of the 
week before we started trial. Um, and whatever that week we had in motion here was that's my best it, standing here now, that's my best recollection of when we learned of the witnesses conflict. And it is a work conflict of witnesses from Los Angeles. Um, he is I believe he's the medical director and chief of whatever pulmonology unit he's in charge of and he has to be back at work Tuesday the nineteenth. That um, this is not a problem we could have foreseen before the trial started. Frankly, I think we didn't have what well, was probably a surprise to both sides of no court on Friday, no court yesterday. It may not have been an issue. Uh, I think it may be an issue now. I think the issue is probably exacerbated now by the fact that uh, the plaintiff did not have a witness to make. We emailed the plaintiff uh, on Saturday this past weekend to say, Tell us who your first witness will be so we can plan. Or anything until yesterday. Um, and we know where Dr. Proctor is, their first witness is up in Broward County. Uh, we know where he was in his testimony on Friday and yesterday. And obviously, to the court, the plaintiff uh, was well aware that Dr. Proctor was not going to be here today. They did not share that with us, they did not share that with the court. And I can tell you that they knew that because the person who's doing their graphics. It's the same company that's doing the graphics just up in Broward County, so they know exactly when the witness is on direct. They didn't finish direct examination until this morning, close to lunchtime. All right. Um, Mr. Vick, I would need to hear um, specifically what you're requesting, and given that you knew this um, potential issue before we started, and did not uh, raise it as a possibility to take the deposition either Friday or Monday while we were not in court. For all people, Your Honor, as that second issue, we didn't know there were, we had no even remote belief that our witness would run into a problem based on how long the trial was represented. There wasn't even a thought in our mind we could be in the third week of trial and not have gotten to the defense case yet. We were operating under that belief based on what the plaintiff told the court back in June. This case would take two weeks and perhaps a day or two of the third week. That is now not the case. All right. Plaintiff, assuming all of your witnesses are available beginning tomorrow, how much longer do you have? We would... Uh, I would expect that we would finish our case on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Mr. Barnhart says when is it? Well, that's going to be a problem, Your Honor. Well, we're not. She just asked a question. I'll get back to you. So. <clears throat> You're looking at the 19th or 20th? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so given the, the three week trial period, that would be seven trial days for the plaintiff and seven trial days for the defense. I'm counting correctly. My understanding is the trial has to be over by the whole jury and the jurors and last week the trial would be over by the 22nd, which is next Friday. Uh, if the plaintiff goes until Wednesday and we need to have closing arguments on Friday, that leaves the defense uh, one day uh, to put on his case compared to multiple days for the plaintiff. I mean, that's just not good. Does not satisfy the process of interest. Is your witness available? Um, perhaps not Monday, but sometime later in the week. You know, my understanding, I will go back to him and ask. My understanding is because we could fit him in later in your case. My understanding is the issue is he was available at the end of this week, which is when we thought we would be on our case. Uh, and could make the following Monday available, but any time after that, for that week at least, uh, is off. Okay, I, I would need to know how long after he's unavailable and the specific nature of his unavailability. If you can find that out, we'll take it up in the morning. 
this far. Okay. You're right. If, if I may, we still have the issue that's kind of the elephant in the room as to we get one day for our case under this schedule. And, and, and as Mr. Begg said, that just doesn't satisfy any kind of due process. We have witnesses, too. We're entitled to time to put on our case and equal time to put on our case. And okay. All right. How many more witnesses does the plaintiff intend to put on? All right. Um, when we leave here today, you all um, are instructed to contact all of your witnesses and line up their availability. Um, to the extent that the uh, plaintiff's case um, extends until Tuesday the 19th, the defense can extend its case till the 25th or 26th if need be. All right, anything else? But if, if you all could tonight, both sides, I need to know all witness availability issues before we start tomorrow morning. Yes, Your Honor. We'll do it. Thank you, Your Honor. Just one last thing. Yes. If, if we're going to be permitted, and I appreciate the court's indulgence to go into that next week, um, two things. One, I think that we've made clear to the jurors that we're going to end on the 22nd, so I, I think we need to make it clear to them that there's a possibility it goes forward. And if so, that there's not going to be blame placed on the defense for, for that happening because we go last. And I'm not saying blame should be placed on the plaintiff, but just that we can say that unforeseen circumstances or whatever. I can address honest. that in the morning. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, we're adjourned. I'll see you all at 8. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. All right. We're adjourned.